Yo, what's going on? What is going on? Welcome to the live stream. This is Edward Williams, founder and creator of Health by Any Means Necessary. Uh, do me a favor, as always, go ahead and press five uh, so I can make sure that you can see me and hear me all right. Uh, I want to especially make sure that you can hear me just fine. I'm outside at the park and um, it's a little breezy out here. It's a little breezy out here. So I just want to make sure everybody, everyone can hear me. Uh, just fine. So go ahead and press five. And um, man, so even though it's breezy, you know, we have a little bit of sun out. I'm in Orlando. Um, you know, our standards when it comes to things being cold in Orlando um, is very low. Like someone from the north can come here and be like, yo, it's hot over here. But for us, man, it's starting to get a little chilly starting to get a little chilly. So I guess you can say we're a little soft when it comes to uh, the weather changing when it comes to getting colder. But uh, I'm loving what I'm seeing, man. You got a lot of people out here right now. You got brothers over there playing basketball. You got kids over here um, playing on the park. You got some brothers over here fishing. I mean, so it's dope. It's dope. I'm loving it. People getting up early first thing in the morning and moving. So um, what's going on? Bonanza, Mika, Barry, what's going on? G, Leslie, Leslie, what's going on? So um, first of all, thank you all for showing up to the live stream. I want to have a uh, conversation about <clears throat> a couple of things, you know. Um, and I, I just want to, I don't, I'm not a fan of anyone telling someone exactly what to think. You know, I, that's not me. That's not even how I work with my kids, you know. Um, it's about think, teaching people or having you think critically about something and also having an organic thought, an organic thought. Um, because when I look at this whole thing right now that's going on, a lot of people are just regurgitating talking points, regurgitating, uh, you know, statements. And I don't think people are organically thinking about what they're saying themselves, uh, especially when it comes to results uh, pertaining to health. There's a lot of inconsistencies, and so that's what I want to talk about. And so that leads us to the conversation about coronavirus, the Rona, corona, right? You know, COVID-19. Um, so first of all, let me go ahead and say this. So, because there's certain people who only came here to see if I try to say that it's not real. Coronavirus is real, okay? The virus is real. If you go back and you check my videos from February, March, April, all of them, I've been consistent in what I was saying. I, back in February, um, when I first had that first video about coronavirus at the end of February, um, you know, I told you about it was real. I told you about how it would most likely become a pandemic. I also said that uh, a lot of people would get infected. So let's just go ahead and get that out the way. The virus itself is real okay i am very much aware that uh it is re it's been reported as it pertains to uh the united states of america we have over seven uh i think seven million cases right now so seven million cases are not right now but seven million americans have been affected by the virus coronavirus that's that is as it's reported right now um, i'm very much aware that as far as coronavirus deaths um, you're talking about over 200,000. And my condolences to those family, families uh, because, once again, one life is way too much. And so definitely my condolences to those, those family, uh, families who have lost that loved one. Um, so I want to make sure that I state that and put that on display. But at the same time, I have a tremendous amount of questions as pertains to uh, how these cases, and particularly these deaths, are being counted. I have a whole lot of questions about those things. Um, I also have a, a tremendous amount of questions as pertains to our overall response and our overall uh, reactions to this whole entire pandemic, okay? I have, I have a lot, a lot of questions. Um, so much of it doesn't add up to me. Um, and a lot of it is very reminiscent of when, you know, when I first started with healthcare and a lot of things with high blood pressure was adding up to me. A lot of things with the cholesterol issue was adding up to me. A lot of things with type 2 diabetes uh, was not adding up for me. And it's the same thing over here with this coronavirus thing. Um, a lot of it is not adding up to me. So, 
in order, when, when, when I'm doing what I'm doing, what we do, what we do with uh, HBAM, health by any necessary. We're not trying to reach the whole entire world. We're not trying to reach the whole entire country. Um, I'm specifically trying to reach my people, okay? I'm trying to reach and get them to understand uh, certain things as pertains to our community. And in order for me to do that a lot of times, uh, I understand that I have to meet people where they're at if I truly want to have an impact. Now, of course, you meet them where they're at, you try to have the impact, and they're very, you know, they want nothing to do with it, then you have to move on. You know, so many of us uh, get stuck on continuously trying to um, convey our thoughts and our message and our mission on people who just don't want to hear it. And you have to learn how to move on versus just spinning your wheels and wasting time. And so, for my people, because I truly care. I'm a part of the community. I truly love them. This is this is the whole reason why I came into the whole health thing anyway. It's for my community, for my people, because I was very um, disappointed and very concerned about everything I was seeing as far as pertains to health. So I say that to say this. <clears throat> I always have to play this game of let's say that is true. All right? The reason why I have to sit, play that game is let's say that's true is because um, once again, I got to meet people where they're at if I truly want to get them out of that burning building or the building that I consider to be burning. If I truly want to get them out of the building, I can't, I got to realize that if I come into the building that is obviously to me burning and I see my people in the building chilling, sitting at table, uh, playing dominoes, um, you know, they got fans on, drinking ice cold lemonade and just trying to become, become comfortable with the burning building, I know it's not, I know for a fact, it won't be enough for me to be like, yo, the building's on fire, come on out. If the flames and everything wasn't enough, I have to approach this differently because I truly love you, I truly love my community and I really want them out. So the message has to be conveyed differently. So um, I have to play this game of, let's say, whatever they're telling us is true. Let's go with that. Um, I had to do that when it came to, uh, you know, high blood pressure. I had to go into that whole thing with, all right, let's say that everything they're saying about uh, the blood pressure issues is all right, wise, and exact. What does X, Y, Z do? Or why don't we still see results with this? Or why are we not trying this? I had to do the same thing with type 2 diabetes. Let's say that it was a, uh, if it truly was a chronic and uh, progressive lifestyle, I mean, condition, why do we see people reversing it? If it truly is something that runs in people's family, why do we see so many uh, people who have that, you know, family member who has it, mother or father, not having it when they change their lifestyle? So I always have to kind of lean into it and say, let's say that's true. What about this? And so I have to do the same thing uh, with this whole coronavirus thing. Let's say everything they're saying about the virus and everything, everything. Let's say it all, let's say it's all true, right? I don't believe it's all true, but let's say it's all true. What we all need to be well aware of is that when it comes to the, the COVID deaths, 40% of people who have died from coronavirus were diabetics. Let me say this again. So in America, we're talking about over 200,000 people who they have reported and they have told us has died from coronavirus. What I'm telling you, well, not, not even me, it has been reported. What they are telling you is out of that 200,000 people, they are telling you that 40% of those people were diabetics. This is an outrageous number. That's, let's say they're true. Let's say that is right. Let's say that is true. That is an incredibly high number. 40%, 40%, that's 10% away from being half. That's a lot. If it was 20%, that would be a lot. 40% is a huge number that I don't think people are grasping. Uh, that, that, that article came out, that report came out, and it just breezed over people's heads. What is it about uh, diabetic patients that makes them so vulnerable? Like why, how do, uh, how is that 40% of the coronavirus deaths? Now, as you all know, if you've been rocking with me, you've been, you know, listening to the works that I'm doing, you understand that um, the foundation, before you can become a type two diabetic, 
you have to be insulin resistant. You're not going to be, it's impossible. You're like, you're not going to be uh, insulin resistant. <clears throat> you're not going to be not insulin resistant and diabetic. Insulin resistance comes before diabetes, type 2 diabetes, all right? Make sure you understand that. So the foundation of type 2 di diabetes is insulin resistance. My question is, if 40% were, and so type 2 diabetes is just one of the many symptoms of insulin resistance. That's what you have to understand. And you would already know that if you watched any of my videos, uh, go back and watch the video that I have pinned to the top of the page. It's called uh, Insulin Resistance Explained. In that video, I go through and I show you what insulin resistance is. I also explain to you uh, why when we're talking about high blood pressure, we're talking about the heart disease, we're talking about cholesterol, obesity, PCOS, and type 2 diabetes, that these are just different symptoms of insulin resistance. The foundation of those conditions is sitting on insulin resistance, making these things not truly a disease, uh, rather a symptom of the actual condition. I hope you all follow that. If not, please go watch that video, Insulin Resistance Explained. I'll walk through it. Uh, it's very thorough. So, if 40% of those patients were type 2 diabetic, before diabetes, you have to be insulin resistant. Insulin resistance um, has multiple symptoms. How many of those uh, other coronavirus deaths were insulin resistant, but maybe not so much a type 2 diabetic? I think we need to really unpack um, what that means. Because at the end of the day, if 40% of these patients, or I'm sorry, if 40% of these, uh, these coronavirus deaths were diabetic, why? What does that mean? Like, why, why are, how is that population so vulnerable? And I'm going to explain that. <clears throat> now, hold on real quick. So, in order to explain that, I have to turn to the book, right? So, the thing about me, you know, I'm not raised, I don't come from a place where you can just go around talking and running your mouth and never show your work, never prove your work. And so since that's my cloth that I'm cut from, you know, it wasn't enough for me just to talk about diabetes. Hold on real quick. Had to actually create a book, write a book. Done with diabetes, uh, five simple strategies to reverse diabetes, get off medications, and avoid complications in 90 days. So it's not enough just to talk about, you know, diabetes is not this, diabetes is this. It's, it's not enough. I got to actually put my work, uh, put my mouth, my, put my work where my mouth is. So in this book, um, on page, let's see, hold on real quick. All right, so you see the brother Marvin, Marvin Gaye. Uh, this is part one on page 17. Um, Marvin Gaye, this, part, this chapter is called uh, What's Going On? <clears throat> Everybody's familiar with Marvin Gaye's song, uh, What's Going On? You know, y'all want me to sing for you? I'll, I'll hold that to afterwards. Uh, but I have this quote by Kathleen Richardson, my very, very good friend, um, great person. I love her. She's dope. But um, in this page, on this section right here, page 18, we have a section called The Silent Epidemic. And I think it's very, very important for us to understand this. So I'm going to do a little bit of reading. Um, this is pretty much like a book stu study, uh, study, almost like Sunday school, pretty much. But we're going to be doing this on Saturday. Uh, this is not the Bible, but, you know, it's definitely the gospel when it comes to diabetes for our community. So it said that, why? Or it said, why do I say that? Because this book is centered around African-Americans. This book is centered around black folks in America because that is the culture, that is the community, that is the cloth that I'm cut from. And since I've spent all this money getting this damn degree, um, I've made sure I put the onus on me to come back to my community and put this this uh, degree to work. And that's what Dr. John Henry Clark said, you know, take what you do best, bring it back to your community. All right, so let's go. So it has been said that type 2 diabetes is reaching epidemic proportions for all Americans. 1.5 million, million Americans are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes every year. So 1.5 million, million with an M. Every single year, we're talking about 1.5 million new cases or, or diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes. That's a lot. Uh, diabetes remains the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. Type 2 diabetes is so rampant that more than 10% of the American population diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, while nearly 30% of the remaining population have prediabetes. All right, y'all catch that? So once again, I told you that, you know, in order to be diabetic, 
uh, type 2 diabetics, you have to be insulin resistant first, and then it progresses to uh, type 2 diabetes. And so type 2 diabetes makes up 10% uh, of the American population. So 10% of the American population is actually diagnosed with type 2, while 30% of the remaining population has prediabetes. And so prediabetes is right before someone becomes diabetic. Now, uh, this problem has become so severe, it's been projected by the year 2030, there will not be enough insulin for all diabetics. So I'm going to get back to that, but I want you all, I'm going to go ahead and make the statement that many of us, all of us, really largely all of us, are being lulled to sleep when it comes to this diabetic and insulin resistant uh, issue that we're, we're facing. We're being lulled to sleep and distracted, massively distracted, but other things that I'm not going to say does not matter, but it just does not have the impact that insulin resistance type 2 diabetes has. And I'm going to show you the impact, like these are things that we can prove for sure. Like I'm not guessing, I'm not, you know, winging it. Like these are things we can actually prove for sure. So I'm showing you things that are actually going on. There's no, uh, we're not pontificating, we're not trying to, you know, theorize, like this is real. And so of the 30% diagnosed with prediabetes, it's estimated that 90% of that 30% are completely unaware of that condition. Therefore, they never take any action. Um, <clears throat> type 2 diabetes affects millions of Americans. However, when it comes to type 2 diabetes, the black community is in the middle of a full-blown silent epidemic. Now, mind you, I've been calling type 2 diabetes in our community an uh, epidemic since 2014. I've been calling uh, vitamin D deficiency an uh, epidemic in our community since 2015-ish. Um, and so we have, you know, we, we have our own epidemics going on. We have our own epidemics going on, but once again, I'm telling you, um, we're being lulled to sleep to focus on other things that does not have the impact as the current issues that we're dealing with right now. If we deal with these issues, uh, such as insulin resistance, the type 2 diabetes, the, the, the deficiencies, uh, the processed foods, if we deal with those foundational issues, most of these other things won't, won't impact us, won't affect us, not the way it's affecting us right now. And so, <clears throat> Once again, with this, uh, this full-blown silent epidemic, you gotta understand that we have an onslaught of dialysis clinics stacked in our neighborhoods to improve it. African Americans constitute more than 35 to 45% of all patients in the United States receiving dialysis care for kidney failure, but only represent 13.2% of the overall U.S. populations. People, family, folks, listen to me. We're not gonna survive with those rates like we, we, can't, we can't survive with those rates. 13.5% or 13.2% of the population, so, it, so they say, I got questions about that too. Um, making up 35 to 45% of dialysis. I hope you all understand exactly what dialysis is. Um, this is a, uh, a the procedure that has to happen, you know, once your kidneys fail, and you know, I talk about this, once your kidneys fail because of complications of Sometimes they say, you know, diabetes, uh, insulin resistance. Sometimes they say high blood pressure. But once your kidneys have <clears throat> failed because just too much damage has taken place, they say that the damage that has taken place is not able to be reversed. And so since they are saying that this damage cannot be reversed, uh, you must be hooked up to a machine called a dialysis machine where it will now filter your blood. That's, what you're, that's one of the jobs, one of the many jobs that your kidney does. Uh, this machine will now have to filter your blood for you. And so this is a procedure that lasts three to four hours at a time, and this is a procedure that has to be done three to four times per week. That is a lot. That is a lot. And so what I'm telling you is that it is not an accident. It is not an accident. Let me turn this thing around real quick. It's not an accident that when we look in many of our communities, we have this very similar setup where we have the dialysis clinic right next, to, next door to the Chinese restaurant, right next door to the pawn shop, right next door to the liquor store, right next door to the check cash advancing. Like, and you can, that is replicated all across America, specifically in our communities. What I'm telling you is that that is not an accident. It's not an accident. It's a pipeline. It's a pipeline because 
you would think with all the advancement that has been happening uh, with technology and all the medications, I just finished reading the, uh, the market report, the futures for the, the market report for the uh, Dallas, uh, I'm sorry, di diabetes. Um, and this is one that's projected from uh, 2026 to 2030. And they're talking about just how much of a, a rampant growth in the diabetes market they're going, to, they're going to be seeing in all these medications that are coming down the pipeline and all these devices that are coming down the pipeline. These folks are not talking about, their, their mission and what they're talking about has nothing to do with decreasing the amount of diabetic patients. They're not. They're, they're done with trying to fool you about that. Like before it was like a finesse. Like we're going to finesse you, make you think that we're trying to, you know, cure this whole thing. But now we're sh the, the next phase is to really make the idea of type 2 diabetes uh, being chronic and progressive. The, that phase of making that concrete is almost complete. And now it's going to be a phase where, you know, you already accept that this is chronic, it's progressive, it runs in your family. You already accept that. We, we've already shown you that now, right? So now it's all about the medications, the devices. What are the best medications that we can give you to continue to increase our profits, our revenue? Um, what are the best devices we can give you to continuously track just how sick you are uh, while increasing our revenues? Um, what, are, what, what is the best way we can subtly abuse you sophisticatedly without you knowing that you're being abused while continuously uh, making money off of your pain, your trauma, your, uh, your suffrage? Like, how can we do this all while being nice about it? but still profiting. That's, that's the phase that's coming, and that's what you see uh, when you look at these market reports uh, for the futures when it comes to 2026 and 2030. There's no talk whatsoever about cutting this number in half or, or cutting this number in a quarter. Like, there's no talk at all. So let's get back to it. <clears throat> and so, um, let's see. So as of 2014, the percentage of African Americans diagnosed with type 2 diabetes was 13.5%. Uh, and the estimates for prediabetes surpassed the 30% range. This means that in a room with three African Americans, for sure, at least one, but maybe two, has the A1C that will put them in a diabetic range. This is a huge problem. Um, and so in this next part right here, it's called It's Cheaper to Keeper. Um, you know, It's Cheaper to Keeper was a song by Johnny Taylor back in 1973. Once again, I won't sing, yo, this book right here, you know, Johnny Taylor, whatever book you know that's a health book or a diabetic book, or a book in general, that has uh, Johnny Taylor, Marvin Gaye, <laughs> Malcolm X, of course. You know, we got Meek Mills here. You, you know, it's just a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> but they're all relevant. And so this section is about the cost of being diabetic. There's, there's a huge cost. There's a huge price tag, you know, um, financially, but also uh, your livelihood is, is financially impacted. And also the, the, the actual price of just being healthy. Um, takes a huge hit. And so, you know, in this part right now, we're just talking about just the cost. We're talking about in 2017, uh, the, uh, the value of all forms of diagnosed diabetes in the United States was $327 billion, billion with a B, billion with a B. So we're talking about 300, that was back in 2017. This is 2020, so we're three years now. Uh, we're talking about $327 billion being dumped down a waste hole, a waste hole. Um, or a waste hole that it looks like a waste hole, but really it's people's bank accounts because these people are making buku money off of, it's very similar. Look, you know what, you wanna know what it's similar to? Shit's very similar to the war on drugs. I won't do it. Let's get back to the book. So um, we talk about all the, the, uh, the direct costs and indirect costs of diabetes, you know, the glucose meter, the needer, needles, the test strips, the lancets, um, but then there's also indirect costs uh, to diabetes, anxiety and its related, you know, treatment, depression, uh, late days, hospitalization, increased paying in health and life insurance, and also other specialist visits and follow-up. So, like, there's a lot to go be said about it. Now, what is the actual impact? Like, what is the actual problem with being uh, <clears throat> diabetic? How does being insulin resistant actually affect your health? Shout out, look, we got Meek Mills up in here. Um, that's Dr. Malefic Kente Asante from Temple University. Um, 
Hey, look, it's OJ. I'm not black. I'm OJ. But hold on. Let me get to the section. Hold on real quick, y'all. Hold on real quick. Oh, there goes Soldier Boy. So it's a, it's, a, it's a health book. It's a diabetic book. But it's wrapped in black culture. The, the foundation of it is in black culture. So, you know, these things are, like I said, this is specifically for us. So what I'm trying to get to right now is just the actual impact of being insulin resistant. The actual, this is Sada Shakur. Hope y'all know who she is. Um, let me uh, get to the page real quick. So in this book, you know, we talk about the tests um, for, for diagnosis and reversal. These are my recommendations, my personal recommendations. These are things that I do with my patients. Um, these are the labs that I recommend people getting. All right, so. <clears throat> So when I talk to you all about what we just talked about with coronavirus, um, and I'm telling you all that they reported, you know, over 200,000 people have uh, unfortunately died from coronavirus, so they say. Um, and I'm telling you that they reported that of that 200 plus thousand, 40% were diagnosed with type two diabetes, right? Before you become diabetic, you have to be insulin resistant. Of that 200,000, we know that 40% were diabetic. How much of the remaining uh, deaths were insulin resistant? This is a very important question because we need to understand that, we need to understand how are people who are diabetic, why are they so vulnerable to coronavirus? The reason why I can speak I could speak so strongly back in February about <clears throat> what we might see, um, particularly for you know our community, is because I understood, I understand how insulin resistance impacts your health. You're vulnerable to everything. The more advanced it becomes, the more vulnerable you be, you become. It doesn't have to be coronavirus. It can be influenza. It doesn't have to be influenza. It can be a toe infection. It doesn't have to be a toe infection. It can be a UTI, urinary tract infection. It can be literally anything. And you, and because uh, depending on how advanced or how, uh, how advanced you are in your insulin resistance, this makes you more vulnerable. So it's not so much about the actual virus going and finding out, uh, finding who is a type two diabetic or who is insulin resistant. What I'm saying is that you are vulnerable because of how insulin resistance uh, works. Well, not so much because of how insulin resistance works, but just the, uh, the environment that needs to be set up in your body to become insulin resistant. It's a very unhealthy uh, environment um, that should not be sustained, but it is. And it's still sustained even if you're taking medications, even if you're doing the whole metformin, even if you're doing uh, the soft on and ureas, which are horrible, uh, even if you're doing the insulin, which is horrible, um, that condition, that environment is still sustained. So we have to figure out how, how, how do we improve it? Because we see the medications don't work. Because you're going to tell me that, what, 40% of those people, well, that 40% that were unmedicated? That 40% was unmanaged? No, what I'm telling you is that it does not matter. So what I want to show you is some alarming stats real quick. All right, so uh, this is a section of the book. It's on page 52. Uh, this section is called, it's complicated. <sighs> so y'all listen up. In the beginning right here, you see I said 24 seven alarming stats. So these, these are things that I'm about to read, things I'm about to read off right now are things that happen every 24 hours, okay? Every 24 hours. And yo, y'all do me a favor real quick. Type five so I can make sure I'm still good. Type five if y'all can still hear me. Type five, so I can know that the, the, the comments work. Um, I just need to make sure everything is still working. Do me a favor and type five in the chat. All right, I'm gonna continue. <clears throat> so right now, what I'm gonna do is set up a framework for you to understand uh, just the overall impact and uh, the damage that goes along with being insulin resistant, okay? Y'all yeah, appreciate it, all right, good, good, good. All right, so high insulin, levels and high blood glucose levels damage blood vessels. That's the first thing you need to understand. High insulin, well high glucose is not a normal state. High insulin is definitely not a normal state. You need to understand that those two things alone 
will damage your blood vessel. Now, you have the damaged blood vessel, but now also understand that this is going to increase the viscosity of your blood. When we're talking about viscosity, we're talking about the thickness. When we're talking about thickness, uh, we would say something uh, such as water has a low viscosity, whereas something like syrup or molasses has a very uh, high viscosity. All right, This is the thickness of the, the fluid. And so <clears throat> when you have that high viscosity in your blood, or your blood is high viscous, uh, this is going to make it extremely difficult for blood to flow through your, your, your arteries, uh, through your, your vessels in general, but it's going to make it especially difficult for it to flow through your blood vessels, to the smaller blood, blood, blood vessels. All right. Now, we have to understand what the blood is transporting, you know, the actual function of blood. And we understand that uh, blood is transporting uh, the nutrients, uh, the oxygen. Uh, it's, it's also taking away the actual byproducts of the cells using this, the, the actual nutrients and oxygen. You're going to create a wa your waste, and your, your blood has to now transport that away from those cells and then also bring it back. And so the smaller those arteries and veins get, or just vessels in general, the smaller they get, the more difficult, difficulty you're going to have getting those vital nutrients to those organs. Y'all follow me so far? All right, so this decrease in blood flow has particular dire effect on the eyes because when you see the, the, the arteries or just the blood vessels in general uh, going to and from the eyes, they're extremely small. When we're talking about the toes, they're extremely small. And we're talking about sexual organs, they're pretty small as well too. And so here's what you need, here are some alarming stats that you need to be aware of. Every 24 hours, every 24 hours, 55 people with diabetes will go blind and never see again. All right. Once again, these are real things. Like these, these are tangible, real uh, impacts that are happening in our community every single day. All right. This is me, not me theorizing. There's no pontificating going on. These are real things going on, okay? So once again, when I'm talking about you being distracted about from what's real and what's already been happening in your own community pandemic that we have in our communities, you need to understand that when you're looking to other things that people have sanctioned uh, it to be okay for you to be concerned about, you need to understand that this is what we're overlooking. This is what we're overlooking. 55% of, yo, how much do you love your vision? Hmm? How much do you love your vision? How much do you love seeing yourself in the mirror? How much do you love seeing your husband and your wife or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mama, your daddy, your, your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew? How much do you love seeing this? Like, I'm, I'm just chilling. I'm telling you that from diabetes, 55% of people will go blind every 24 hours. I hope y'all understand that. I hope you understand how big of a deal that is. 120 people with, di uh, with diabetes will be diagnosed with kidney failure and placed on dialysis. I just told you about dialysis. This is a procedure that takes three to four hours at a time and has to be done three to four days per week. Think about how much of your life it will now be uh, dedicated to being on this machine because you got to understand, like, this is not something you're doing in your house. You're going to an actual clinic. You're going to a diabetes clinic. And it's not something you can just pop up. You got to actually drive there. You have to actually, you know, be situated. That's a lot of time dedicated to something that's being caused by something that's preventable and reversible. 120 people every 24 hours will be diagnosed with kidney failure, meaning your kidneys, supposedly, what they say, it's no longer functioning and you would now have to be placed on a machine that would do the job of your kidneys. 220 people with diabetes will have their limb amputated due to complications of type 2 diabetes. So, I had a patient. <clears throat> I didn't know what to expect. I just had his file. Um, I knew he was there, uh, particularly for diabetes. No, no, no. He was actually, this patient was not there relating to anything diabetes. Um, actually, I don't remember now because he only came once. But I walked in the room. And when I walked in the room, I dropped either my pen or the, the pad that I had, I dropped it, but when I dropped it, I'm a little extra, you know, like the whole 
athletic thing always comes out when anytime something is quick happening I'm quick to move I'm quick to spin I'm quick to jump like you see something just a little bit much um, and so when the pin dropped I quickly jumped back to try to you know grab it and catch it and um, the guy who was the, my patient who was sitting in the room he was like man look at that boy I would love to have my leg again and he only had one leg and I'm looking at him now. I didn't know before walking to the room that he had an amputation. He had an amputation from type two diabetes, something that completely caught me, caught me off guard, and um, that humbled me in a way because I'm like, you're talking about being appreciative. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm I'm so thankful for my my, my legs. I'm so thank thankful for my foot, my toes. Um, there's so many things that we already have right now. Uh, that, you know, I don't think we think about just how fortunate we are to, to have those things from your fingers, your toes, uh, the feeling, the normal feeling in your toes that is not something dealing with uh, neuropathy, where it's just numbing and tingling, all those things. So um, I think we need to make sure we understand that and also understand that <clears throat> this condition that causes that can be prevented in reverse. So that's huge, 220 people will have, uh, we'll have an amputation. All right, so complications of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. So many people don't know that high levels of insulin and glucose increase the thickness of your blood. I already told you that. Because of this increased thickness and stickiness, the stickiness part you need to make sure you catch. The risk of strokes and clots dramatically increase. So diabetics, and once again, this is, I want you to make sure that you continue to Connect this back to what I was saying as far as the, uh, the initial conversation uh, with the coronavirus. Like, make sure you go back and you connect that. Because when you see all of this, the 40% that have unfortunately passed away from the, from the virus, this will all help you make sense of that. And this is why I'm saying that this is the foundation of what needs to be dealt with. So. Um, diabetics have a 170% increased risk of dying from cardiovascular <laughs> disease. Diabetics have a 180% increased risk of having heart attack. Diabetics have a 250% increased risk of having a stroke. All right, these are huge numbers. So once again, even, it, it doesn't have to even be the virus. If you're dealing with this condition, you're already vulnerable. So that stands to say that if I'm telling you that a large percent of our community is dealing with diabetes and a large percent of our community is dealing with insulin resistance, I'm telling you that we already have an epidemic going on in our community that we have to exchange, we have to transfer the energy and the, the focus uh, that we have with coronavirus right now. We have to make sure we keep that same energy when it comes to the things that we already have going on. We already had these things going on. We going to have these things going on in the future and we can't wait for outsiders to come in and sanction it to be okay to talk about the things that are impacting you on a daily basis impacting us on a daily basis Alzheimer's and dementia uh, Alzheimer's is really just type 3 diabetes I told you that I called type 4 diabetes PCOS um, what you need to understand is that once again insulin affects every organ in your body including your brain so which could also, your brain can become insulin resistant and lead to Alzheimer's. When it comes to chronic inflammatory pain, uh, high levels of insulin causes inflammation in many areas in your body. Uh, this frequently occurs to the joints and nerves. Uh, this can lead to symptoms that closely mirror arthritis and fibromyalgia. Depression and anxiety. And this is a big problem um, among diabetics that I don't think uh, many, well I know many of them don't understand, they're not aware that this is, this is one of the symptoms, um, but I think it would help out a lot of people if they understood that this comes along with it, which is depression and anxiety, because it helps you identify you know, what may be going on. So due to high insulin and glucose levels, certain amino acids that are required for adequately functioning um, neurotransmitters are blocked from crossing the blood-brain barrier. This increases the incidence of both anxiety and depression. Diabetic retinopathy. So high glucose causes damage to the blood supply of the eye, more specifically the retina. Uh, this damage can lead to blood loss of the retina, which over time leads to blindness. Diabetic neuropathy, nephropathy, nephropathy. 
Damage occurs through the filtering ability of the kidneys. When the kidneys are damaged by a mix of high insulin and high glucose, the ability to retain the needed proteins while removing waste dramatically decreases. This damage is ongoing. If this damage is ongoing, the kidneys will no longer uh, function properly. And then we have diabetic uh, polyneuropathy, high insulin, high blood sugar damage to sensory and nerves uh, throughout the body. Over time, this will lead to numbness, tingling, and an inability to detect pain, heat, or injury. This condition most often affects the feet. All right, so I, I hate hearing, um, you know, I, I, I hate hearing about the neuropathy. I hate hearing about all these things. But when my patients describe just the neuropathy, it bothers me so much. Um, one, you need, you need to understand that if you're taking uh, metformin, that it makes you vulnerable to neuropathy. Um, and that's because uh, B12, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, metformin has a side effect of decreasing the uh, B12 and the folic acid. Uh, B12 and folic acid, especially B12, is very much important for the uh, myelin sheath that surround the nerves. And <clears throat> when you are taking that metformin, it's going to decrease the amount that your body has. So. You, someone should be having, your practitioner, whoever wrote you that medication needs to be having that conversation with you, okay? Um, and then we talk about the decrease in immune system and infections. I mean, look at this. I'm sure I sound like a broken record. However, I want to make sure that you understand that, understand this, high insulin and blood sugar damages virtually every aspect of our bodies, including our immune system. Now, mind you, I wrote this book back in 2019, all right? There was no talks of coronavirus or anything. But I'm framing, this, this book was framing this conversation that we're having right now, this, this issue that we're having right now. I don't, I'm not a fan of us intensely focusing on this whole, you know, pandemic the way we are while missing the actual foundation. And people, particularly people who have the knowledge and information who are purposely doing that, in my opinion, they're misleading you. They're misleading you because that energy is non-existent when it comes to these very preventable and reversible conditions, such as type 2 diabetes, such as insulin resistance. Because when you understand insulin resistance, which, once again, please go back and watch the video that's pinned to the top of my Facebook page. It's called Insulin Resistance Explained. Um, get the book, Done With Diabetes. The link is in the description. The link is in the video. But once you understand what it is, you're going to understand that you're vulnerable to everything. It's not so much that this current virus is just that uh, damaging for type 2 diabetes, diabetics, is that you're vulnerable because of everything that takes place. I just read all these stats to you. I just read all these stats to you. It's because you're vulnerable. And you have to get yourself out of that uh, vulnerable state. And so I go through and I talk about all those things. All right. So. <clears throat> Everybody good? All right, yeah, I see. Um, how do you get the book? So somebody's asking, how do you reverse it? How do you get the book? All right, so first thing first, um, Tanya, appreciate you, sis, for being here. Uh, please make sure you go back and watch the video. At the top of my, my Facebook page, it's called Insulin Resistance Explained. It's not enough for me to sit here and tell you about fasting because I'll, I'll fa fast yes fasting is a huge part uh, of the uh, protocol to reverse type 2 diabetes um, we eat way too much and the foods that we're eating are the worst we're eating nutritional colonizers uh, so we need to understand that we need to understand the terrain it's not enough just to grab a gun and go out in the battlefield and start shooting you have no strategy whatsoever what I'm telling you is that you have to be strategic and understand what you're facing what you're up against that video, Insulin Resistance Explained, will let you under, will help you understand what is going on. Because once you're going on, my goal is to get you to understand how you got to where you're at. And because I, I believe that, I believe enough of my people that once you understand what got you to that point, Common Sense is gonna kick in and tell you what you need to do to get out of that situation or it's going to at least get you started in that right path. Because once you understand that, oh, my lifestyle put me in this situation. The foods that I'm eating put me in this situation. The drinks that I'm drinking put me in this situation. The fact that I don't move put me in this situation. What should I do about this situation given the fact that I understand what actually got me here? 
I should probably start doing the opposite. I should probably eat, start eating whole foods. I should probably start moving. I should probably stop the soda, the juices. I should probably uh, stop eating so much, so frequently, given the fact that you're telling me that every time I'm eating all these uh, multiple times a day is making me insulin dominant. And so the reason why I choose, I, 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 uh, I lean to that side hard is because that empowers you and takes me out the picture. I don't want to be in the picture. I don't want to be this whole, this, this leader thing. I don't want to be any of those things. The actual movement and the mission for the radical improvement of our community has to be the leader. You know, um, Tariq Nasheed talks about the, the movement being the, the, or the leader being the, uh, the, the, the movement being the leadership versus this individual. And I completely agree with that. I don't want to be the whole, I'm not trying to do the whole leadership thing. We need to understand what the problem is and let that desire to radically improve our communities by any means necessary be the actual leader. That way, when something happens to a person or an individual, the movement still continues. That way, when the next generation comes and the person or the people who were uh, foundational in that movement, the movement still continues. And this is how you make a movement unstoppable. This is the reason why people such as uh, Malcolm X still have a huge impact on our community. He had a huge impact on me. Never met the guy. Never met him. What, I mean, I can't remember exactly what year he was assassinated, but you're talking about a kid at the age of 14 who met Malcolm X for the first time while sitting on Black, Black Planet. Y'all remember Black Planet? Um, and saw one of his black and white videos. And that changed the trajectory of my life. Same thing with Martin Luther King, same thing with uh, 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 Marcus Garvey, the same thing with Ida B. Wells, uh, the same thing with Asada Shakur, the same thing with so many of our heroes. Even though they are no longer, quote unquote, alive, the mission, what they stood for, and the energy and the spirit still is around. And so that is something that we can have confidence in. If we allow, if we cultivate and allow this this movement this idea to grow that we are not destined to be sick that health is our birthright uh, that the foods are nutritional colonizers which makes sense that the colonizers would give you more internal colonizers um, to rob your body of its natural nutrients this vital nutrients that all would make sense if we understand those things then the conclusion that we come to would be one that could last that would be effective and also last for generations to come so I hope you understand that um, now, what I need now, what I want to to wrap things up to close things. We talked about the coronavirus. We talked about how many people are affected by the coronavirus. Uh, we talked about you know over seven plus, seven million plus uh, cases have been diagnosed in America. So they say, uh, two hundred thousand plus uh, deaths from coronavirus, um, and those things are very real. And we see people getting up. At the, in the beginning of this, we saw people getting up every single day uh, doing the press conference. Um, we see the, uh, the recommendations. Uh, we see even now a lot of your practitioners uh, becoming very uh, active as pertains to this conversation about health, but not holistic health, like not health as an actual whole, more so health as an actual part when it comes to this coronavirus. And so, they have gotten so close, myopic, when it comes to uh, this one problem that they're missing everything else. And so what you need to understand is that if I'm just, if I'm telling you everything about the effects of, you know, diabetes and insulin resistance, what you need to understand is that masks, they do nothing at all for your type 2 diabetes. Like they have no factor as far as improving it whatsoever. Washing your hands a thousand times a day uh, does nothing as pertains to your diabetes or your insulin resistance. Um, you know, social distancing does nothing as pertains beneficial for your type 2 diabetes. Now, still do those things. Get what I'm saying? Like, you got, and this is, you know, my teacher, Professor Aaron Smith, uh, talks about not getting into a tug of war uh, with these folks. Have that. Do that because those things are important. But what I'm saying is that, how does that improve the foundational issue, the foundational problem? If I'm telling you that the foundational issue and problem is 
uh, insulin resistance. How does, because when we see those cases of people uh, who unfortunately are passing away from it, um, and we see the, uh, the percentage of those, those deaths, we understand that we tie it back to insulin resistance. And so it would stand to reason that if we truly wanted to uh, have an impact, a beneficial impact on improving the community and improving the country, then we should really start looking at foundational things uh, such as deactivating insulin resistance and masks won't do that, uh, hand washing won't do that, uh, social, distancing, social distancing won't do that, uh, sharing videos about somebody getting told off about not having masks, like none of those things would do it. Those, are, those will get you intangible victories. Those will get you symbolic victories. Like these are things that you can feel good for in the moment, but it won't do anything as far as truly improving your health. I have a huge problem with this because what I see in my weird mind when I look at this is, once again, black people being used as a political batting ram. Political batting ram. Where they're using your energy and your force and your uniqueness to break down a barrier. But you know what happens to the batting ram once they break down the barrier, right? You get tossed to the side. They go in, they get the bag, they out, and you sitting there laying on the side with nothing, nothing tangible from it. Um, and so I'm very uh, weary when it comes to how we're, we're looking at a lot of those symbolic victories and feeling great about it. Because once again, I feel that a lot of it is being, we're, we're, we're being foot soldiers for other people's uh, agendas while not getting anything tangible from it. And we have to be careful with that. And that's always happened. So this is not the first time. If you look through our history, this has happened multiple, time, multiple times. So if we truly want to get the real results, then we have to focus on the basics. In the book, I talk about the basics. Uh, in the uh, video, Insulin Resistance Exp Explained, I talk about the basics. My whole entire website, my whole entire Facebook, my whole entire Instagram is dedicated to the aggressive uh, and radical improvement of health in the black community. So as far as, you know, what do you need to do, the videos are already there. The book is already there. Everything is already there. I think my, my goal, my, my job right now is to um, really light that fire under my people's ass and let you know it's possible. You know, excuse the French, excuse my language. Um, but also to inspire because I'm not guessing. Like I'm not, this is no theory for me. I'm dealing patients every single day. Well, well really not every single day, but largely Monday through Friday. Um, and seeing them radically improve their health by doing very simple things, simple things. So yes, um, you have to make sure that you eliminate or radically decrease nutritional colonizers. Nutritional colonizers are the processed foods. And once again, everything I'm saying in the book, the, this is the blueprint, this is the book, uh, this is the, the diabetic Bible for our community. Um, that's what I wrote it for, like everything about that book, that whole entire essence. Uh, matter of fact, when you first read the very first page in this book, I'm kicking in the doors, uh, talking about some historical things. Um, so. Yes, <clears throat> this book gives you the, the five simple strategies. Um, you know, I'm talking about the nutritional colonists. Just pretty much stop the processed food or radically decrease the processed foods. Um, the juices and the sodas, they do nothing beneficial for you. Even the ones that are supposedly sugar-free, even the ones that are supposedly uh, healthy juices, and like it's, it's sugar, it's diabetic fuel. Um, the processed foods, once again, they strip you of the magnesium, the calcium, the potassium, all the vital nutrients that you need to actually uh, heal and recover. Um, and when we get to uh, things such as um, the deficiencies we have, our communities, our community, we're, we're talking 85 to 95 percent of our community, people in our community being vitamin D deficient. Vitamin D is not a vitamin, it is a hormone. You need to understand that this is a huge, huge, huge problem. This is a huge problem. Um, I've done plethora of videos about this, um, posts about this. My website, the video, everything I do, that is your tool, that is your resource, please use it. Most of the, everything I'm talking about is already there. Just take some time and use it and go through it because it's not enough for me just to sit here and say, all right, do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. If you don't have the conviction, if you don't have 
uh, the confidence, the belief, like if you don't have those things, whatever you start doing just because I'm like saying do this, do this, do this, like it's only going to last like a week or 14 days. Like it's not going to last long. Why? Because you're not even convinced. You don't even know the impact. You don't even know how you got to this point. If you don't know those things, then that fight you're putting up, it won't last long and it won't be effective. So um, next, um, drink way more water, uh, get more sunlight, get more movement, stop eating so much. That whole six small meals um, was a travesty. Like that whole six small meals a day thing is so bogus, it's so dangerous, it's so deadly, it's had a huge uh, negative impact on people as a whole. But even still right now, it's hard for people to let that go. Like people still believe if you want to be healthy or if you're diabetic, you have to eat six times a day, you have to eat six small meals a day uh, so that you can manually regulate your blood sugar. And once again, I don't just talk it, I walk it. Uh, in my book, Done With Diabetes, Five Simple Strategies to Prevent Diabetes, Reverse Diabetes, Get Off Medications in 90 Days. Um, there's a whole section where I'm going through and I'm playing that game, let's say this is real or let's say this is right. I'm doing that game and I'm going through and I'm talking about the six small meals a day. I'm talking about you know chronic and progressive and I'm giving the counter argument while showing you what else you need to do. So um, we need to understand those things. Um, so fasting, so you know, uh, yes, fasting is my gospel. This is a shirt for our um, community, our group that we have, uh, the Fast Life 28 Day Challenge. Uh, we'll be uh, starting up another challenge relatively soon. We'll let you all know the dates. But um, fasting is my gospel. gospel. Fasting is one of the things that I know for sure. Overnight, if the community started to implement uh, a plan of fasting, that would radically improve our health overnight. Overnight. Um, it could be something as straightforward as, you know, 18 hours a day of fasting, 16 hours a day of fasting, one meal a day. One meal a day will change your life. All right. One meal a day will change your life. And that's stepping away from dictating what's healthy and not healthy. I have patients, you know, some of my patients, um, once again, I work with them. I, I meet them where they're at. A lot of my patients are just not willing in the beginning to give up certain foods uh, and give up certain drinks. But if I can get them to uh, really close that window that they're eating to four hours a day or just uh, one meal a day, they still get results. Now, of course, I'm still pushing them to um, eat healthier. And believe it or not, the push becomes easier because once they start, you know, oh, one meal a day, just eat once, once especially for my truckers, because I, I have a lot of uh, guys who are truckers and they're like, you know, I'm, I can do one meal a day easily. Um, and so once they start doing those things and they start seeing results, they start checking their blood sugar and they're like, 140? Man, I ain't seen 140. One guy's from me, he's like, man, I ain't seen 140 since I was, I was a baby. Now, he's dramatic. That's, he's my comedian. I love that guy. Um, but people start seeing these results and they're like, well, damn, all I did was not eat. <laughs> all I did was just have one meal a day. All I did was stop you know, drinking the soda and juices. And so it's about meeting people where they're at. And then from that time, guess what? They are, they want to know what else can I do? Like, so once they start seeing the results that they got on their own, they're like, well, what else can I do? What if I start doing this? Or what if I start doing that? What do you think about this? And then that's why I know it's a wrap. It's a wrap for type two diabetes. It's a wrap for insulin resistance. It's a wrap for being a slave in this healthcare system. Oh, did I say that? Shit. But yeah, it's a wrap because now you know, you're like pulling back the curtains. You're like, Yo, this whole thing is a, it's a sham. Like, it's a scam. It's a sham. It's a fraud. It's not real. Ha, ah, you got me. You tricky, tricky devil. You got me. So they start seeing those things. They become empowered. And then they take it from there. And that's it. I'm out of the picture. I don't want to be in the picture like that. I don't want to be the centerpiece. I want to be out of the picture. So those are my recommendations. So I hope everybody understands. What's going on, Barry? I'm moving forward to greatness because of what you teach. Yo, I appreciate it. I'm glad to hear that. Keisha, what's going on, sis? Uh, thank you for taking the time. For sure, for sure. That's, that's the mission. Uh, what's going on, Ellen? You're welcome. Darlene, what's going on? No problem. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, y'all. So uh, this wraps up the video. Once again, coronavirus is real. <laughs> but type 2 diabetes is also real. You saw... The implications that come from uh, type 2 diabetes. You saw how many people per day go blind to never see again 
from type 2 diabetes, 55. Uh, you saw how many people uh, are placed on dialysis uh, every single day, every single 24 hours from diabetes. You saw how many people have amputations every single 24 hours uh, from diabetes. Uh, you saw the increase uh, that in heart disease that comes from being a diabetic, the increase in strokes that comes from being a diabetic. Um, you, see, you see it, like these are things that I'm not theorizing, like this is real, this is real. And then we see how, what percentage of people who have died from coronavirus, we see what percentage of them have actually been diabetic. We're not really sure how many of them are insulin resistant, um, but it stands to reason if this thing has been going on, diabetes, insulin resistance, has been going on in our community for the longest, and it makes us extremely vulnerable to literally anything. Like, you know, like, I have to, my, my, my initial, when I have the initial consults with my uh, diabetic patients, um, and especially if they're on, already on insulin, I'm like, yo, take your shoes off, take your shoes off, take your socks off, because who knows what's going on with your feet right now? Unfortunately, a lot of them have no one told them that they need to check their feet. And so we start looking at the feet and a lot of stuff is uh, heartbreaking because you may already be to a stage where this is only going to get worse. And so this comes from that condition. I'm telling you, you know, the smaller blood vessels are going to suffer. Whatever's being fed by those small arteries and veins are going to suffer dramatically because of the high glucose, because of the high insulin. And if they're suffering in those smaller arteries and whatever's being fed, you are at risk of losing that aspect of your body or at least uh, having issues with the proper sensation in those areas of your body. So once again, these are things that have been going on. They have been going on. Since they have been going on, it makes you vulnerable to everything. Everything. Like you don't even have to have something outside of you happen. It can just be a nail that you clipped improperly. It can be the fact that you stubbed your toe. Uh, it can be the fact that you had a UTI. Like you're already walking around vulnerable. And so if something is making you that vulnerable, to things that happen to you on a daily basis, it stands to reason that we probably want to put that same energy and that same level of focus that we have on this new uh, pandemic. We, we put it on the actual virus, all right? So my phone's about to die. Um, I appreciate you all. What's going on? Y'all are very welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and sign off before this video gets erased because my phone died. So um, I love y'all. Make sure y'all check out the book, Done With Diabetes, uh, Five Simple Strategies to Prevent Medic Diabetes, Reverse Diabetes, Get Off Medications in 90 Days. Um, the book, the link is in the description. Um, the book should be also in the description as well too. Uh, also make sure you check out the video at the top of my Facebook page called Insulin Resistance Explained. I love y'all. We have to make this all happen. We have what it takes. This is our community. This is our responsibility. Let's get it. All right. Peace.